Our first speaker is Dr. Joseph Ledoux, the Henry and Lucy Moses Professor of Science at New York University Center for Neuroscience and Professor of Psychiatry in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Okay. Uh, at the New York uh, NYU's Langon Medical School. His book, amply titled Adel Anxious, received the 2016 um, William James Book Award from the American Psychological Association. I'm happy to say he's a fellow of AAAS and a member of the National Academies, but he's also the lead singer and songwriter in the rock band The Amygdaloids. <laughs> True. True. This is quite an interesting merger, merger, if you will, of personal and professional interest. I did not ask him if his uh, slides were to a certain soundtrack, but we'll, we'll find that out soon enough. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ledoux. Uh, thank you. I should have brought uh, one of the amygdaloids videos uh, called Fearing, which is appropriate. You can see it on YouTube, though. Um, it's about, it's basically based on an Emily Dickinson poem about uh, her problems with fear and anxiety. But today what I'm going to be talking about is uh, what's going on in the brain with fear and anxiety. And, you know, I was just reminded sitting here that the last time I was here was also around Halloween and was to record something uh, for a Halloween program. So I must be on the, the Halloween list uh, in this uh, organization. Um, so you probably have heard a lot about the brain mechanisms of fear, and probably have heard that the amygdala is an important part of the brain's fear center, an important part of the brain's fear system, how it makes fear. But I'm gonna, what I'm here to tell you tonight is that that's wrong. If I can figure out how to advance the slides, I'll just do it here. Um, you know, our ability to understand the brain is only as good as our understanding of what we're asking of the brain when we study it. We've made a lot of progress in developing techniques for studying the brain. We can measure genes, we can manipulate genes in neural circuits in incredibly precise ways. But if we don't know what we're studying uh, when we do that, if we don't have a good conception of what we're studying, we're not going to find what we're looking for. And this is especially problematic in areas where basic science findings like those that I generate are used to try to understand and treat clinical problems. Um, a lot of what I'll be talking about tonight is from my book, Anxious, but also from an article that Danny Pine, the second speaker, and I, uh, I wrote and recently published in the past uh, few weeks. Um, and so it's good that we're here. We can be a kind of tag team promoting our particular point of view on all of this. So, you know, the words we use to talk about things are important. They underlie the way we conceptualize and, and think about problems, uh, how we communicate with other scientists, and how we communicate with the public, which we're doing here tonight. So the, uh, we need to be clear about what we mean when we use a certain word, uh, like fear. And for many years, more than, well more than 30 years, I've studied something called Pavlovian fear conditioning uh, in rats. I've done a little bit of work on humans as well, but primarily I've worked on rats. Um, and over the years, I began to be uncomfortable with this designation, fear conditioning. Uh, how can we really know what a rat is experiencing? Uh, and many people who also study this same paradigm will say, well, we're not really studying fear in the subjective sense, but as I'll try to convince you, uh, that is uh, what most people think you mean when you say fear. So we need to be a little more precise about what we're studying. But this paradigm has been incredibly successful. We've learned a lot about, I don't know whether any of the, oh well. We learned a lot about the behavior here on the left. The pointer should be on the top of the middle. I'm pushing, but it's, it's not doing anything. It's all right, I, I can get by with that. Learned a lot about the behavior, about the neural circuits involved. Uh, about the cellular molecular mechanisms at certain synapses in the amygdala that are uh, involved with all of this. That's the amygdala sitting in the center there. So it's a key part of this fear conditioning system. Uh, and it's been tremendously successful, uh, not only in basic science, but also been used to study a variety of uh, psychiatric problems, uh, trade anxiety, panic disorder, PTSD, psychopathy criminal behavior, psychiatric symptoms in active duty Marines, early life vulnerability to psychiatric problems, and of course phobias uh, that, that aren't on this slide but are an important part of this. 
Um, and the idea that's emerged is that the amygdala is a fear center, so that a threat comes into the brain, it's processed by sensory systems, it generates a, a fear state in the amygdala, and that fear state drives the responses. Defensive behaviors like freezing in rats, uh, people will freeze also when a sudden danger occurs. And physiological responses that support all of this. Increases in blood pressure and heart rate, release of stress hormones, and all of these things that, that are not only in the body, but they feed back and, and also influence what's going on in the brain. So basically, threat arouses fear in the amygdala, and fear drives the responses. This is based on classic findings. For example, uh, people with brain lesions, people in animal with brain lesions um, in the amygdala uh, basically show deficits in responding to threats in this way. So phys behavioral and physiological responses are impaired. So the idea is that the amygdala activates fear, fear causes the responses, uh, and therefore damage to the amygdala must eliminate the fear. Brain imaging studies, similar thing, when people are exposed to a threat, the amygdala is activated, therefore that fear in the amygdala is uh, what drives the responses when people are uh, exposed to a threat. So it was uh, a big surprise when a few years ago, uh, a woman with amygdala damage uh, was reported to still feel fear. Uh, headlines in Nature, Science, sorry Science, but I'm gonna criticize you here for a minute. Uh, Scientific American, Wired, Discover. Uh, Humans can still feel terror even if they lack the brain's fear center, scaring the fearless, evoking fear in the fearless, on and on. So what's going on here? Um, and why shouldn't this have been a surprise? Well, it's been known for quite a while that threats elicit activity in the amygdala and can produce these bodily responses in, in healthy people if you use subliminal stimulation techniques. And the people have no awareness of the stimulus and don't feel any fear, and yet they're still responding the way we talk about when we talk about fear responses. People with blind sight do the same thing. These are people who have damage in the right visual cortex, and so they're blind, they're cortically blind in the left side of space. In spite of not being able to report anything on the left side of visual space that occurs there, uh, they can uh, move their hand to, that, to an object in that part of space, uh, and they, if you present a threat in that part of space, it elicits behavioral and physiological responses, characteristic of, quote, fear. So you don't need fear, and, and they don't report feeling fear again. So you don't need the conscious awareness of the threat, and you don't need the conscious feeling of fear in order to respond to a threat. Fear is not what's driving those responses, and fear is not coming out of the amygdala. So uh, this was reported uh, by Liz Phelps, my colleague at NYU, and Adam Anderson in 2002, but it didn't get all the, the headlines that the 2013 paper did. So you know, as scientists, we have to kind of, really, we should be paying attention to what's in the literature rather than just running with preconceived ideas uh, and making assumptions, or not even, not even questioning the assumptions that we're working with on a daily basis. So one of the problems is that in our own minds, the, when we're afraid and we find ourselves running, these things often go together. You know, if you are running from danger, you're feeling afraid while you do that. So it makes sense that the running away should be caused by the fear that you're feeling. It just seems a natural thing. But when we take these things apart in the brain, we see that that's not exactly the case. Um, so what we're doing is committing the, the first sin that a scientist uh, needs to be aware of, which is not confusing correlation with causation. These events are correlated in our experience, but in our brain, they're caused by different events. Now, as a neuroscientist, I can explain everything about Pavlovian, quote, fear conditioning without using the word fear. The CS, or tone, comes into the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. There it converges with the unconditioned stimulus, or the shock. So the tone and shock come onto single neurons. Plasticity occurs in those neurons. And the next time that tone comes through that circuit, it more easily gets through the circuit because of that plasticity. If you squirt norepinephrine along the, in this process, the learning occurs a little more efficiently and the responses are expressed more strongly uh, at a later time. So we don't need fear as a construct to explain any of this behavior. This doesn't mean that fear is an irrelevant construct. It just means that it's not what's causing the rat to freeze 
when it hears a tone that's been paired with a shock. You know, you can do this kind of conditioning not only in rats, but also in snails and flies and bees and worms. You can even condition protozoa, single cell organisms. So fear can't be the explanation of why organisms respond to danger. Fear is a psychological process that we build in our brains on the basis of information processing by the highest centers of our brain, which I'll talk about later. So rather than talking about the amygdala as a fear center, we should be talking about it in terms of threat detection and control of defensive behaviors and physiological responses. So the, I, what I would like to replace this, this idea of a fear center with is a defensive survival circuit, a circuit that is present in all animals in some form um, and that can detect danger and respond to danger. And so this defensive survival circuit will involve the amygdala in mammals and other vertebrates, but in invertebrates, they don't have an amygdala, but they have their own circuits. In protozoa, there's no defensive survival circuit because they don't have a nervous system, but they have their own way of doing this. Uh, by ion channels and electrical impulses and so forth, they can respond to threats just as we can. Bacteria can respond to threats. So the idea that the reason an organism detects and responds to danger is to make you afraid is ridiculous. This has been around since the first cell has ever existed. It's about survival. It's not about emotions. So this misunderstanding about the difference between threat detection and the feeling of fear and anxiety is widespread. It's built into the conceptual basis of the research, the funding mechanisms, ideas about what underlies uncontrollable feelings of fear and anxiety in the brain, and the use of this re research as a way to help treat uh, fearful and anxious people, and the depiction of the work in the media as well. So here's another example. Um, I'm from Louisiana, so I say crawfish. So crawfish treated with a benzodiazepine were more exploratory, less inhibited in a chamber where they received electric shock. This was published in Science as well. Um, headline, Science said, anxious crayfish may be treated like humans. New York Times, even crawfish get anxious. But the BBC was a little more cautious. Maybe they experience fear and anxiety. So what's going on? Why does this matter? Well, since the 1980s, billions of dollars and millions of animals have gone into the search for new and better treatments for fear and anxiety. In 2010, the CEO of Glasgow Smith Klein concluded that the efforts have failed and new investments wouldn't be made because of the low probability of success. Andrew Holmes, a leading researcher, reached a similar conclusion. These efforts have been disappointing as promising results with novel agents and rodent studies have rarely translated into effectiveness in humans. So what's going on? So these are some various tests that you can use to um, uh, develop a new drug to treat fear and anxiety and through an animal model. Uh, for example, elevated plus maze, top left there, the rat or mouse is put on the open arm of an elevated uh, uh, maze there where it's unprotected. Um, rats are prey, so if, uh, if the rat were in an unprotected area like this, a hawk could swoop down and, and eat it. Same way in the open field, if it's in an open area, it'll run to the side. In the uh, elevated plus maze, it runs to the uh, uh, enclosed area. So if you give, the idea is that if you give the drug, or give a, uh, the animal a drug that's going to relieve fear and anxiety in people, it will make the animal move into the safe place uh, less quickly. So the animal will be less timid, and since the behavioral response timidity is thought to come out of the same circuit as the experience of fear and anxiety, then Measuring timidity in the animal should give us a drug that makes the people makes people less fearful or anxious But uh, this doesn't necessarily always work. In fact, it hasn't worked very well uh, in all these studies that have been attempting to develop to develop new drugs um, But it's possible that the drugs are doing exactly what they were designed to do uh, Maybe a person on a drug like this let's say that has social anxiety might be more willing to go to the party in other words less timid but still feel anxious while there. In other words, the person would not feel that the drug was helpful, but if the drug did in fact do that, it would allow the, the person to be exposed to the party, to figure out who's safe and who's not safe at the party and so forth, and to kind of self-treat them, uh, self-expose themselves to the, the threatening cues that way. Um, and so, the, you know, the, uh, perhaps we have the wrong idea about what 
we've been expecting of, of this kind of research. And if this is correct, you know, and different, what I'm proposing is that different systems in the brain underlie the conscious, the conscious feeling of fear or anxiety and the behavioral and physiological responses to threats, and this was part of the, the article that uh, Danny and I wrote as well. Uh, if that's true, then different treatments may be required to treat the conscious feelings, the subjective experience of fear, and the behavioral and physiological responses that also occur. Now, I'm not saying that all the animal research is a waste of time, because it is important that we be able to reduce the behavioral and physiological responses. These are part of the, the symptomatology that the person experiences, but it, they may have to be treated separately. So if the conscious experience is occurring in cortical areas and the non-conscious processes in subcortical areas are controlling the responses uh, and the anti-anxiety medications are working there, but people are feeling fearful and anxious there, uh, it, it makes sense why the drugs wouldn't uh, be working. Now, we've learned a lot about consciousness in the brain in recent years through imaging studies, uh, developing correlates of consciousness. For example, if a person is, is, is exposed to a visual stimulus uh, in a way that the person can be consciously aware of it, you get what you see on the bottom. You get visual cortex and prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex activations. But if the stimulus is presented subliminally so that the person isn't aware of the stimulus, you only get the visual cortex. So in order to be conscious of the stimulus, you need to engage these additional cortical areas. Um, this works if it's a threat as well, except that you get amygdala activation, both for the, uh, the conscious processing of the stimulus and for the non-conscious processing of the stimulus. So it's not just like you know, a small part of prefrontal cortex that's involved. It's a, a large swath of tissue in the medial and, and lateral areas of prefrontal cortex, also insular cortex. So the, the areas that have been implicated in conscious awareness across a lot of studies uh, are complicated. Um, so it's not going to be possible to find a patient with a little lesion here or there that is not going to be conscious. So we have to use, at this point, correlations to try and, and get uh, information as well as we can. But there have been studies, for example, that get more to the causation of it with TMS. If you use... Uh, if you, um, use TMS to inhibit certain cortical areas, neocortical areas in the prefrontal cortex uh, during this, this kind of task, then you can block the awareness of the stimulus. So that's a step, at least, towards uh, causation. And there are different theories that have emerged, for example, higher order theory or global workspace theory, but they all, all the leading theories uh, these days um, go along these lines of having these networks in the prefrontal and parietal areas that are engaged when one is conscious of the stimulus. So what I'm proposing is that we don't need a separate mechanism for conscious feelings of fear or anxiety. The regular old conscious mechanisms are going to do the trick. What we're, what's different about an emotional experience, say a feel, a, an experience of fear, is not the brain system that's involved relative to a non-conscious, uh, uh, sorry, a non-emotional conscious state. It's the inputs that are coming into that system. So, the idea is that what's different about an emotional versus a non-emotional state of awareness, or what's different about different kinds of emotional states of awareness, is that the conscious system is processing different kinds of inputs, different kinds of signals or ingredients. So the idea is that emotions are feelings, feelings are conscious experiences, and these kinds of ingredients that go into the making of a conscious experience differ when it's an emotional and a non-emotional experience. So we can think of this similar to the way we would think about making a soup. Um, water, onions, garlic, carrot, celery, salt, pepper, or chicken. These are not soup ingredients, but when they're combined in that, this particular way, they make a soup. And if there's chicken in, it's a chicken soup. Uh, if you put roux in there, it becomes gumbo. If you're from the Far East and you put curry paste in, it becomes uh, something different. So just as the flavor of a soup emerges from its ingredients, the flavor of a conscious experience emerges from the ingredients or the inputs coming into the brain mechanisms that are involved in our conscious experiences. That's the bottom line of the idea. And here are some of the, the various kinds of inputs that would be relevant. For example, you have to have sensory processing of the, the threat. 
You might have survival circuit processing, in other words, amygdala activation, because that's going to generate body arousal, body feedback, and so forth. Uh, it's also going to uh, initiate attention to the outside world. But some of these other things are going to be true of any kind of conscious experience. So it, again, it's a matter of the ingredients. Um, now, let me just skip that for a second. One of, the, one of the kinds of ingredients that's important in a, in a, a non-emotional as well as an emotional conscious experience is a schema. Schema is a body of knowledge or information that is uh, putting information together and holding it uh, as, a, as a kind of core of knowledge. We develop these schemas we go through life. So as children, we begin to learn through dangerous experiences what danger is, what kinds of situation danger occur in. Occurs in. And through these kinds of experiences, our fear schema begins to um, uh, be activated, uh, be, uh, be created. And as we develop a more and more sophisticated kind of fear schema, that opens up the range of ki the kinds of fear experiences we can have. In English, we have more than 36 words, three dozen words, to describe different aspects or kinds of fears and, and uh, uh, anxieties of uh, fear, anxiety, uh, panic, horror, terror, trepidation, consternation, uh, on and on. These are all variations that, uh, that can be generated, but you have to have the kind of conceptual information in there to have that kind of experience. But important point is that you don't have to get very far into the schema in order to activate the schema. Through a process called pattern completion, the presence of a threat, number one there, is probably enough to put you into the fear mode in that schema. If you add that to the possibility that escape is not possible, uh, certainly then you, your brain has moved into the point where fear is what you're going to experience. Adding in tachycardia and norepinephrine and epinephrine released into the circulation, uh, cortisol released into the circulation, having various kinds of feedback effects on the brain, these are going to amplify the experience and give it that classic fearful kind of uh, tone to it. Now, um, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, great. So the idea that emotions are cognitively assembled states made by information available to working memory is related to Claude Levi-Strauss's idea of bricolage. Now, I don't mean this in any literal sense, but I think it's a useful and, and interesting uh, metaphor to talk about. So in French, this means to put something together from items that happen to be available. So Levi-Strauss emphasized the importance of the individual, the bricolure, and his social context in the construction process. So other researchers have, have noted that maybe persons, objects, contexts, the sequence and fabric of everyday life, or the medium through which emotions come into being day to day, a kind of emotional bricolage. So in the brain, working memory can be thought of as the bricolure and the content of emotional consciousness resulting from the construction process as the bricolage. Now, you know, we, as we go through life, the significant events we experience connect us to others. And although our conscious experience of these may vary considerably, underneath are universal survival circuits that operate implicitly but similarly in each of us. Fear based on a survival circuit seems universal because it has universal non-conscious ingredients not because it's an innately formed experience that's been inherited from animals. These survival circuits and their consequences connect us at an implicit level to other members of our species and give us common ground in social interactions. So our brains can implicitly detect the implicit consequences of survival circuit activation in others through body language, through nonverbal communication. In the same way, survival circuits connect us to other species. Uh, we thus relate to other people and other species in way that, ways that defy words and logic and contribute to things like theory of mind and anthropomorphic attribution. So in science, you know, anthropomorphism is, uh, is not a, a, a very good thing, I don't think. But in life, uh, it, it's acceptable. Uh, the, it's often been said that anthropomorphism may be an innate feature of the human brain. But just because it's innate doesn't mean that it's scientifically correct. That animal, just because we impute emotions in other animals, just because we think our cat loves us uh, the way we love it, doesn't mean that it actually does. Um, but it's very useful for us to treat our cats that way, just as it may have been very useful to our ancient ancestors uh, 
to treat other uh, animals in this way so they could be domesticated and uh, related to and, and useful in our lives. So um, I think this is an important point that, that what is in our brain may not be scientifically correct. It's kind of an interesting uh, conundrum. So let's talk a, be, a bit about uh, some of the implications for um, uh, psychotherapy. I'm not a therapist. I'm not, um, uh, I've never been in therapy, so I have no business talking about it. But I wrote a book about it, so I guess I'll <laughs> mention a few things. Um, and Danny will correct me on all the things I get wrong here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about too much. I, I want to skip over the, some of these quickly and get to three in particular. Um, but this is basically, basically about exposure therapy, which is a common form of therapy now, where you have a patient who has a problem, say a phobia, say a spider phobia. We have had spider phobias up there on the top, or spiders on the top up there a while ago. Um, so if you expose the, per the person to the phobic object, the idea is that you weaken the, uh, the impact of that stimulus, and therefore the person can then deal with it more effectively. Now, this works to some extent, but uh, it's notorious for being temporary. So a person is then exposed to threats of other kinds, irrelevant threats, uh, uh, and the phobia can be brought right back, or simply by the passage of time, the phobia can come back. So scientists have thought have sought to try and uh, find better ways to, uh, to make exposure therapy more effective. So one idea would be to uh, expose in multiple contexts. Um, we know from animal research that if you do this, uh, the exposure, the extinction process, so-called, uh, is more effective. So we could try that. Um, focus on core triggers rather than the entire memory. So rather than focus, let's say you have a person with a, a trauma, a trauma is a very complex set of memories. Rather than focus on the big trauma, focus on the specific triggers in that trauma. Uh, space training. Uh, science has shown that, um, that if you cram, like the reason students don't do well if they cram is because cramming uh, depletes an enzyme in the brain called Krebs, which is, in, is necessary for the formation of memory. So when you cram, you deplete that enzyme, and you can't form memories as effectively. So the idea would be to space the, the therapy session out more, uh, make it three hours instead of uh, 45 or 50 minutes. Um, that uh, things that happen after learning are well known to produce what's called a retroactive interference. So after you've learned, if, if something happens after that, it can uh, interfere with the, uh, the, the learning that take, has taken place. So, uh, what we might want to do is have set up the patient uh, after the, the session to have a quiet time in a, in a room where things are going on that are, um, have been shown through empirical studies that haven't been done yet, but that could be done, shown to not interfere with the exposure that, that you're trying to achieve. Uh, so now we're taking the, the three-hour mass uh, space training session, adding a couple of hours for the uh, prevention of retroactive interference, uh, and then we want to let the patient sleep because sleep is a time when memories get consolidated. So maybe it would be best to, instead of having a six or seven or eight hour session, to do all of this in the patient's home so they could go right to bed right afterwards. Now, the therapists are not going to like any of this because it's totally impractical. But being a scientist, I don't have to be practical. I can just say what would work, uh, and you can pick and choose as you please. Now, uh, the last three things I want to talk about, uh, I'll highlight here. And these are directly relevant to what I've been talking about in the research and the article that Danny and I uh, wrote about. Wrote. <clears throat> so one would be non-conscious extinction or exposure. So we have these subliminal techniques. Why not take the spider and present it subliminally so that the person didn't consciously know the spider is there? One of the problems with doing it regularly is that the person can undergo what's called flooding where they, they're so physiological aroused by knowing that the, the uh, spider is there that they basically freak out. So if they don't know, if consciously they don't know it's there, uh, the amygdala is being extinguished and the physiological responses are maybe big. The person doesn't understand why they're aroused, but they don't know that the spider's there, so it's not so bad. So once you've done that, once you've kind of gotten the amygdala under control, you then do conscious exposure so that you can uh, have the conscious mind not uh, 
having all the associations with the spider as well. And finally, once you've extinguished the, the unconscious uh, processing in the amygdala, the conscious processing in the cortex, you can then do psychotherapy because the brain has been prepared better for psychotherapy. Um, so those are just some armchair speculations uh, that, that I have about all this. So again, a lot of this is in my book, Anxious, and in the paper that Danny and I wrote, Using Neuroscience to Help Understand Fear and Anxiety, a Two Systems Approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ledoux. That's a lot to, to think about. And we'll move on now to our next speaker. Um, it's Dr. Daniel Pines, Chief of the Section on Development and Affective Neuroscience in the National Institute of Mental Health Intramural Research Program. His research tends to focus on pediatric mental disorders, and he's his group is currently taking a look at the degree to which pediatric mood and anxiety disorders are associated with perturbed neural circuitry function. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and president of the Society of Biological Psychiatry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pines. So it's really great to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, it's great to talk about the things that I'm going to talk with you about. Uh, but I also really want to thank uh, the organizers for the invitation because it is a wonderful opportunity to really illustrate some of the ways that science moves forward best. So Joe and I both care very deeply about the topic that, that I'm going to talk about. It's going to be a very similar topic. Uh, that Joe talked about, but we come at it slightly differently. So as you just heard, Joe is really interested in understanding how the brain uh, lets us feel different kinds of emotions, uh, including fear, and I'm interested in that as well. But I'm particularly interested in using this information to come up with novel treatments. So where science really advances is when two people like Joe and myself care about the same things, have somewhat different ideas, and work together to come to a common ground. And, and that's really what, what I'm going to talk about. So I am going to focus on children and adolescents, but the, the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, are going to be relevant for uh, really adults as well. Uh, and I am going to talk about phobias, although you'll see there, there's only one point that I'll where, where the word will appear. Uh, what I'm really going to talk about is a whole suite of emotional problems. And the reason that I'm going to talk about all of them together is that we know that all the different terms that we use, like phobias or generalized anxiety disorder, and even things like depression that we talk about as being distinct, we know that they're very closely related. And we're struggling right now to kind of recognize the boundaries that separates those different kinds of conditions. So there's really going to be two parts to the talk. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about clinical things. And I'm really going to talk about three sets of things. I'm going to talk about the different flavors of emotional problems that people have and make a fundamental point about what happens to children with those problems as they age. I'm going to talk about how these problems aggregate in families. And then I'm going to talk about what we know about treatment. And then I'm going to come back to a lot of the ideas that Joe was talking about really at the end of his talk. Uh, I'm really going to take one or two key ideas and talk about the, how the kind of work that Joe has been doing really leads to direct ideas about novel treatments. And, and that's the last thing that I'll talk about. All right, so as I mentioned, there's a whole suite of different kinds of emotional problems that people can, can get. And probably the most concerning common one that we see is something called major depressive disorder or depression. So the rates of depression, and it, and it matters how you really define them, are somewhere between 5 and 20%. Um, it's relatively easy to differentiate normal sadness or normal problems uh, with depression from what we think of as clinical depression. And that has to do with the 
pervasiveness and persistence of it. When depression is abnormal, we experience it every single day, all day, for many, many days in a row. And that's very different from the kinds of transient, normal sadness that all of us have. Uh, it tends to have dramatic impacts on how people are functioning. And this is quite different from anxiety and phobias, as, as we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and there's a very precise relationship between age, gender, and the risk for depression. Depression is very rare before puberty, and there's a dramatic increase in rates of depression with puberty, and this increase primarily happens among girls. So the rate is about twice as high in girls as it is in boys, and this very tightly relates to stress sensitivity, after puberty. When depression starts, it's frequently recurrent. So one of the most important reasons to talk about depression and phobias together is that we can treat phobias and anxiety much better than depression. So while it's important to treat anxiety just in its own right, it's also important to treat it because it might actually prevent the onset of depression. Because once depression starts, it's very difficult to get rid of it. So what about anxiety? There are also different flavors of anxiety. So obsessive compulsive disorder is one kind of anxiety that refers to recurrent worries about very particular things, like maybe I've sinned in some way, and it's associated with recurrent acts that are designed to neutralize that, so it would be prayer. PTSD is another kind of anxiety that develops after trauma. And we tend to think of OCD and PTSD as kind of separate groups of disorders based on how we treat them and what happens to them over time. Phobias really fall in this third group of disorders. And these are the disorders that we all tend to think of as a group. And we think of them as a group because when we follow people that have one of these problems, they're just as likely to develop one of the other problems as they are to have the problem that they have persist. So people with phobias are at risk for having phobias over time, but they're also at risk for developing things like panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. So phobias and anxiety are much more common than major depression, and it's much harder to put a clear boundary between normal and abnormal anxiety. The easy way we do it as clinicians is we think about impairment and avoidance. So clearly anxiety is abnormal when it prevents us from doing things that other people can do. The problem is there are a lot of people who don't avoid anything and have very high levels of anxiety. And for those people in particular, it's very hard to draw a line between what's normal and abnormal. And that's the case with phobias in particular. The relationship with anxiety and gender is different from with depression. This gender difference starts very early. By the time kids go to school, anxiety and phobias are more common in little girls than they are in little boys. And this, among with other things, makes us think that anxiety is often a precursor to depression. And that, that does turn out to be true, as I'll talk about in a minute. So, as I just mentioned, anxiety often predicts major depression. And we know a lot about longitudinal relationships from a series of studies that individuals like me began in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And we followed kids as they matured. And we, developed, we assessed them many, many times over time. And this shows you just one slide from a study that I was fortunate enough to spend about 20 years doing with colleagues from New York, uh, Pat Cohn and Judy Brook. And this study looks at about 700 kids with different kinds of anxiety problems. And it asks the question, what is the relationship between having anxiety as a child, impairing anxiety as a child, and having any kind of an emotional problem as an adult? And there's three basic things to take away from this slide. Point number one, anxiety is incredibly common. 253 of these 679 kids developed anxiety. Point number two, it usually goes away. 
191 of these 253 kids who had anxiety, when we saw them as adults, were fine. And this, uh, we think, relates to some of the ideas that Joe was talking about, ideas about extinction. So it tells us that maybe if we understand how people overcome their anxiety and overcome their fear, as these 191 children have done here when they grew up, we might learn a lot about how to treat anxiety. Now, a lot of people, when they see this finding, they think, well, anxiety's really not that important, but they would be wrong. And the reason they would be wrong is this third finding right here, which looks at the 98 adults who had any chronic emotional problem in, adult, in adulthood, and we see that 62 of these 98 had their problems start when they were children. So the bottom line is problems are very common in childhood, number one. They usually go away, number two. But number three, that minority of children who have persistent problems will mature to account for the majority of adult problems. And this is why, when you see people like me talk about mental illness, we talk, talk about mental illnesses as disorders of the young. That all mental illnesses have a similar pattern of arising out of seeds or roots that we see in childhood. All right, we also see very similar things in families. We see that childhood anxiety is often the initial sign in families of a problem related both to depression and anxiety. It, it usually goes away here as well. And we see parents, when they hear this, are always asking, well, who, is it my fault or you know, is it my wife's fault is usually what they say. And the bottom line here is that there are no big single causes that includes both genetic and environmental causes. That anxiety emerges out of like a soup that Joe was describing with both genetic and environmental effects. And there are certain things we can learn from these kinds of studies. And, and one of them, probably the most relevant clinical one, is about the importance of encouraging kids who are nervous to be exposed to the things that they're afraid of. Because one of the few predictors we see in families is that families who encourage their fearful kids to go out and face the things that they're afraid of, those kids do better over time. And there are many different measures that, that we have that give us clues about that. So there are basically two sets of treatments, and I'm not going to go over them in a lot of detail, that we have for all of these disorders that have been shown to work reasonably well. They're selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI medications. These are things like Prozac or fluoxetine. And there's one form of psychotherapy in particular, and that's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm going to talk to you in just two, with two studies what we know both in depression and both in anxiety about the efficacy of these two treatments. And the story is in some ways similar, in other ways quite different. So the similarities have to do with the kinds of designs that these studies used. You see this design right here. And what happened in these studies is that children were brought in in both studies. This, this one's on depression. I'm going to tell you about one in anxiety in, in a couple of slides. They come, in, they come in and they're randomized to one of four treatments. If, if a, a one comes up on the number, the, the family is told, you might get placebo, you might get fluoxetine. If a two comes up, the child is told, you might get placebo, you might get fluoxetine. If a three comes up, the child is told, you get CBT. So CBT is unblinded here. It's open, all right? And if a four comes up, you are told you get both CBT and active medication. So you are unblinded there. That's very important. And there are two bottom lines from this study. Bottom line number one is if you look right here, you see that this is actually two lines right there. That is CBT and placebo. So bottom line number one, and this is kind of bad news for us, as people who want to help kids who are depressed, CBT in this study does not be placebo. All right, and that's a problem. And overall, the rates of response in this study were not that great, all right? Point number two, when you look at these two lines, these are the lines that has fluoxetine alone here 
or fluoxetine with CBT. And when this study came out, like Joe was talking about headlines, the big headline here was the, the advantage to the combined treatment. But that should really not be the big headline. The big headline should be that fluoxetine was actually quite helpful for major depression in this study. However, it wasn't nearly helpful enough. All right? So we really struggle to treat depression. However, when we look at anxiety disorders, the story is quite different. And this is the exact same kind of study using the exact same kind of design, except here the medication is sertraline, not fluoxetine. Fluoxetine is Prozac, sertraline is Zoloft. And the story is different in two ways. Number one, look at these two lines. These two lines come together. This line is the CBT line alone, and notice what happens here. CBT beats placebo. So CBT for anxiety is a better treatment than CBT for depression. It's better in that it works more than placebo, and it's better in that the overall rate of response is also better. All right? And you can see the response to the medication here is comparable. So medication and CBT are comparably effective for anxiety, and both are more effective than placebo. It's true in kids. It's true in adults. And there is more benefit to the combined treatment. So the good news here is we know a lot about treating anxiety. And, and you know, maybe people will ask about what I consider the first line treatment. I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. And I will tell you that I consider in my clinic cognitive behavioral therapy to be the first line treatment. And, that, and that's good news that we have that. The bad news is even with the combined treatment, we still need other treatments that, that do better. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. The last thing to talk about is that there, there is a lot of controversy um, that has come up about medications. And, and again, we could talk a lot about where that controversy comes from. I think some of it is justified and some of it is not. Uh, the part that's not justified is that medications for many children and adults are very helpful. And I think people need to know that. Um, the, where the controversy comes in is that my field in particular has struggled to tell just the right message about medications being helpful on the one hand versus having substantial problems on the other. And I think that that's created more controversy than is really good for the field. And one of the pieces of controversy that's important to talk about is the association with thoughts about suicide. And that's what this slide shows you. And what's illustrated, I'm not going to go into the details in the interest of time, but what's illustrated in these dots going down like this is it's particularly a problem before the age of 25, these thoughts about suicide. All right? That's a real problem that we need to be aware of. And it's one among many things that, that makes me think if we have two treatments like CBT and medications that work equally well that make me uh, think about CBT as a first-line treatment on the one hand. On the other hand, this is a small effect, much smaller than the data on efficacy. So if somebody has an anxiety disorder and they don't respond to CBT, or somebody has depression, antidepressants are totally reasonable, good treatments. So hopefully I, thread, I threaded that needle. What's the bottom line? Response rates are higher in anxiety, both in adults and in kids, than they are in depression. Relapse rates are much higher in depression than they are in anxiety. So that's one of the reasons why it's really important to treat anxiety. All right, in the last 10 minutes or so? Eight, eight minutes or so, oh gosh, all right. I tend to like to talk, so uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to talk about neuroscience, uh, and this is going to come back to a lot of the stuff that Joe has talked about. I'm not going to reiterate some of these points that we are kind of stuck as a field, and I think one of the things that happened um, is that you know many years ago I saw Joe uh, giving a talk. I'm quite cantankerous, um, and I kind of gave him a hard time. Uh, saying that, that he was making it sound so easy. And you know, Joe's response was basically, hey, I, I don't know anything what I'm talking about, how to help people. I'm just trying to move us forward. Can you help me? And um, I do think that that's where we're getting. And I'm going to give you a couple of concrete examples about that. Um, we are not going to get new tests very soon. 
But what we are going to get is we are going to get new treatments. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so all of these are basically based on fMRI. Um, and they're going to, what they are going to do is they're going to give us clues about what goes wrong in the brain. And what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to use those clues to come up with new ideas about treatment. And the nice thing about fMRI is it's a non-invasive measure that lets us take pictures of the brain uh, without using anything that's in any way dangerous. And, and this slide illustrates that principle. And it lets us uh, measure things like amygdala function that you can see right, right there. And a lot of the research that I do tries to evaluate the relevance of the kind of work that Joe does. And once we determine that it's relevant for patients, thinking to think about how we use that information to improve treatment. So this is, I actually stole this from Joe like 15 years ago. This is one of my favorite slides. Um, and I've been uh, pursuing the idea in this slide for about the last 10 years. And there are two key ideas to take away from this slide. The first key idea is that the way we use neuroscience is that we try to understand a complex behavior where we can tease apart the underlying neural circuitry in rodents and non-human primates, and then we use that information to try to do something clinical. So this slide, Joe uh, published this more than 20 years ago, and he, he made the point that what happens in this experience right here, and these were ideas based on work in rodents. This was not based on people, but he was talking about the degree to which this snake is capable of capturing attention. And the key idea behind this slide was that this happens incredibly rapidly. And we can think about this as the reflex that you have when you pull your hand off the stove. All right? When you pull your hand off the stove, what happens is you pull it off, and then you think, oh my gosh, why did I do that? The stove is hot. All right? So there are two components to this. There's this rapidly deployed component that we're not aware of, and there's this more slowly deployed component. The second thing is what, how this is relevant clinically is we did, and I'm not going to show you the slides, but we did go and do the brain imaging experiments and we discovered that in people and in people with anxiety disorders, something is also wrong with this circuit and it also unfolds incredibly rapidly. So rapidly that people cannot talk to you about what goes awry in their brain and you cannot change the way the circuit functions only by talking to them. All right. So the procedure that we have developed is what we've developed video games. And what these video games do is they expose children to certain kind of trials over and over and over again, typically using angry faces. And what we and other people have shown is that this can clinically improve anxiety, but most importantly, it works together with CBT, such that children who respond to uh, CBT with this training tend to do better than children who have CBT without the training. And the way that I think about this, uh, my two favorite things growing up in life uh, were science and hitting. Those were my two things. So you can imagine my favorite book was by Ted Williams. It's called The Science of Hitting. And Ted Williams made the point that any time you have a rapidly deployed motor act, like swinging a baseball bat, there are two components to that. One is that you have to kind of learn the rules. So for hitting, it was knowing the strike zone. So Ted Williams taught all his hitters, think about this pitch right here. And you can think that he wanted, this was his best pitch. So when he walked up to the plate, he was thinking about that pitch. And you can think about that if you were trying to drive a car, you can think about that as learning the rules of the road. Or if you had anxiety, you could think about this as having your safe person. So Kalina is one of my students who's very nice. She's sitting in the audience. I look at her when I'm nervous, and I can think about that uh, and feel calm, all right? There's a second component of being a big hitter, and that is 
practicing over and five minutes, that is practicing over and over and over again. You have to swing this bat a thousand times. And so when Ted Williams walked up to the plate, he, he stopped thinking about the strike zone and he just uh, got himself in a place where he could let his practice take over. That's why we don't let kids just jump in the car and drive after they learn the rules of the road. And maybe treating anxiety is like that. We have a slowly deployed component, the consciousness component that Joe was talking about, where we teach patients how to do things through psychotherapy, but then we have rapidly deployed things like this attention reaction where we have to do other things besides just talking to patients. So that, that's one concrete way in which understanding something about neuroscience, understanding something about how the brain works, leads to a concrete change in the way we do treatment that we never would have thought of if we didn't have the neuroscience. The other way is just coming back in the last minute is this idea about who are those 191 kids that overcome their fear. Remember we talked about that, that we can talk about that as extinction. Um, there's there's uh, actually a lot known about uh, overcoming fears that way. There's actually another way that Joe has discovered to actually erase fears. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. But these are both ways that we've learned from rodents how fears can be overcome. And the important thing about that, and this is similar to one of the slides that Joe showed, there's a complex neurochemical architecture that we know a tremendous amount about because this work begins in rodents and non-human primates and we can map the circuitry very precisely, we can come up with a whole bunch of other novel ideas. One is um, using uh, chemicals to tickle this system to help people learn, and the other is learn, using some of the ideas that, that Joe was talking about, about what we know about um, memory and how we can enhance things like CBT by using those kinds of manipulations. All right, well, so I really, hopefully, I, I did two things very rapidly. Um, I gave you this whirlwind course about what are emotional problems. So I, I talked both about phobias and other anxiety disorders, but also depression. And I made this point that anxiety and phobias are important not just because they harm people every day, but also they predict all kinds of bad things. And I, I talked to you about what we know about treatment, which is uh, pretty much... Uh, but we need a lot more. We need to learn a lot more, and particularly about treatment. And that's really where the neuroscience is most gratifying to me, that I think the, the most concrete way that neuroscience is going to impact the lives of patients is not by coming up with new diagnostic tests or, or not by reformulating the way we think about human behavior, but by coming up with novel ideas about treatments that are more likely to work than the kinds of ideas that we've come up with traditionally. So I, I will tell you that uh, this is my real phone number. People are always shocked when they call me. Um, and I, I answer my phone. That's part of being a government employee. And that is my real email address. And I do answer, it might only be three words, but I do answer every email address, so every email. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll move over there and have uh, questions, right? That's. I think I'm on. Am I on? Yes, on. I'm on. All right. OK, we'll have a, a, a couple of questions from me, and then you can, there are mics on both sides, and you'll be invited to line up and uh, ask the speakers questions. Um, what's, the, what's the difference, except for the numbers, uh, between um, the anxiety that a particular person might feel and mass hysteria? What, what's going on that's different? when a community, a nation, whatever the case might be, uh, everybody seems to be hysterical and anxious about something. What, what, is, what is going on? All right, well, so we can talk about that at many different levels. Um, we can talk about the phenomena that an individual experiences. And we know that uh, humans as social beings uh, respond tremendously to the feelings that other people have. So uh, when times are tough, humans pick that up from other humans, and it tends to be hard for all of us. So we can talk about it at that level. And then the other level that we can talk about it is, is it harmful? 
And you know, the most uh, obvious way to think about it being harmful is when you think about how it impacts your ability to do things. So for example, uh, we can start thinking that mass hysteria is really bad when every night I can't go to sleep because I'm thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen if the election goes this way or that way? Right, and, and at, at a certain point, um, that becomes uh, abnormal enough that people need help. Um, so we, we need to think about both the individual, what they're responding to, and we also need to think what is going on socially in their context. When we talk about mass hysteria, that means that a lot is going on, a lot of people are upset, and the level of upset that the individuals are having is quite high. Do you want, now you study, I know, social, mice are kind of social beings, right? Or study rats. Rats, oh, right. See, <laughs> like me, I, a rat, a mouse, who, what's the difference, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't really study much of the social behavior, but you know, one, one of the things that's often said about um, emotions is that they are self-perpetuating. So once you're in an emotional state, the all the hormones that are released kind of lock you into that state. And the point of that is if you're in the wild in an animal, it's important that you um, uh, stay locked into the threat and not have your attention wandering. Uh, but the other thing is that these kinds of states are contagious, uh, especially amongst people. And uh, that's where you get to mass hysteria pretty quickly. So what do you... Um well, let me, let me get the issue out uh, first. Uh, you're probably all familiar uh, to, to some extent with what has been referred to as the creepy clown phenomenon <laughs> as, as Halloween approaches. Um, and you can't help but not be aware of it if you watch or listen or read news. You don't have to encounter this personally. I mean, it's just all sorts of media that are, if you will, broadcasting uh, what is going on with regard to this. Um, so what do you tell a, a child, a young child, let's say uh, anywhere from six to seven or eight, um, about uh, what is going on? What, 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 when do you get to the point that you think perhaps the child, it's past parental, uh, providing parental comfort, et cetera, and maybe the parents want to know, boy, maybe he, he does have a, a, a serious medical issue that at least should be looked into. And you get this call or, or the, the email, whatever. What do you, what yeah. do you say? Well, so I, so I would say two things about this. One thing is, you know, again, my people who, who hang out with me, my students, my families know, I'm, I'm a big media guy. I love media. I think media is wonderful. I find all the, I look at the amygdaloids, YouTubes, and send that kind of stuff around. And it really is great that it exposes us in real time to all these amazing experiences that, you know, when I was a kid, we never... You know, I waited in line for Space Invaders forever, and you know, it was pretty <laughs> awful. So that's a good thing on the one hand. On the other hand, it's, it's a pretty bad thing, particularly for kids, in that it can expose them to things in a way that when I was a kid, we didn't get exposed to. And so there are a lot of phenomena like that. I mean, the creepy clown is one example. You know, even quite honestly, the presidential debates, right? I, I have parents saying to me they don't know if they can let their their kids watch the presidential debates because the amount of stimuli that kids are exposed to is just really extreme, and um, and it's a problem. Now, you know, um, I would never, I would never advocate any kind of censorship. On the one hand, on the other hand, I do think it creates an additional burden on parents, and I, and I think the creepy clown phenomenon is part of that. So that's one thing to say. Second thing to say is that you know pediatricians are really wonderfully equipped to deal with this kind of thing. And that is absolutely the first place that any parent who's worried about any mental health problem in their, in their child, pick up the phone, talk to the pediatrician, eight times out of 10 they can handle it, and the other two they'll call me, so. Dr. Ledoux, do you wanna add anything to that? No. Okay, let me ask people if you begin to sort of line up to uh, ask your questions. I would ask you to uh, be as succinct as you can, and if you're directing it to one or the other, maybe start by an, an, um, uh, making that clear. And I'd ask you also to identify yourself with an affiliation, if you would. Please, sir. Ted Bremner, Howard University. We know that 
when mice are infected with toxoplasma, they lose their fear of cats. That's how they get eaten, and that's how toxoplasma perpetuates itself. Could this work in the opposite direction? Are there any conditions that might predispose to the development of um, anxiety or phobias? And by conditions, I mean inflammatory disorders, infectious diseases. Is there any association or connection between these? Uh, well, first of all, I would say that the, uh, the mouse or the rat that's infected doesn't lose its fear, it loses its defense against the, uh, the rat or the, uh, against the cat, uh, since we don't know whether the rat or mouse is consciously experiencing fear. Let's blame science for the misinterpretation. <laughs> <laughs> know that a lot of things like certain forms of stress and the release of stress hormones at an early age in a persistent or prolonged way can predispose the child to then develop anxiety or depression later and then maybe Danny can pick it up from there. Well, it's actually, I'm glad you brought this up because I, I want to ask you about the, I don't know that everybody knows, the, the question relates to work by a, a wonderful writer, uh, Robert Sapolsky, who's very much like Joe in that he's a wonderful scientist, but he also does, um, writes wonderful books, kind of science books. And he, the work that you're describing showed that um, there is this phenomenon that's almost, to be quite honest, it almost sounds too fanci right. fanciful right. to be true. Can you, can you comment on the work and, you know, well, so exposure to uh, <clears throat> um, cat feces, for example, can, in a mouse or rat, uh, the, the toxin, and I forget exactly what it is, but it, is it a virus? Yeah, it's a yeah, virus. It's a virus. In, the, in the feces, can enter your bloodstream uh, systemically, go to your brain, if you're a cat, uh, sorry, a rat, and cause specific damage to the amygdala for whatever reason. I mean, the, the, the kind of uh, folklore about the, this is that it now makes the rat impervious to the cat, so the cats can now attack them. Okay. On the other side of that, uh, rats and mice hear in a range that um, cats don't hear. So um, they can squeak at like uh, 60,000 hertz, 60 kilohertz. Uh, and it's a kind of secret language where one rat can squeak at that level to tell another rat that there's a cat nearby or that something dangerous is nearby. These are defense calls. And the cats can't hear it, so it's like a secret code that they can express. Mm -hmm. So each species has its own tricks, uh, you know, what's been described as evolutionary arms race. And so I guess you could think of toxoplasmosis as part of a cat's way to get a, a leg up. How, you know, it's an impressive uh, little trick that, that nature's come up yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's some concern that pregnant women shouldn't There is. Be pregnant women should not. That's why that. pregnant women shouldn't have cats for that. Dear my cats for that. Okay. Among other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over here. Uh, name and affiliation, please. Uh, my name is Todd Wiggins. Uh, good evening. Doctors Frankel, Lado, and Pine. I have a question along the, you know, hopefully along the humorous track that we're on right now, considering we're on the uh, cusp of another Halloween celebration, and we've got our uh, spider rings out front to prove that. So perhaps you can provide an anecdote of uh, relating to how fear has produced great inventions and constructive ways in which people have turned their fear into something that was productive for society at large. Well, I mean, I I guess it, I'm not sure it's productive, but presumably something like the atomic bomb was based on fear. Um, lots of weapons uh, obviously based on fear. Uh, something productive. Uh, As a side note, I was going to say, no weapons, please. No weapons. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, socially, I think, uh, you know, we see this in children, how they develop, and then we see it in um, human relationships that one of the most um, potent socializing forces is our fear of harming another person. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think that some of the great social uh, phenomena like altruism at least partly reflect 
you know, the internal fear state that we have. And conversely, we know that there are certain kinds of problems that people have, and uh, something called callous and emotional traits are probably the best example of, of this. When people don't have uh, these normal mechanisms for feeling fear, um, they can you know, do horrible things. So, so I think fear helps us you know, respond not only to the environment, but to our peers. The, you know, an important point is that fear and anxiety are perfectly normal responses. Yeah. Yeah. We do use them to stay alive, um, you know, even though I'm saying that, that our ability to detect and respond to danger is not the same thing as fear. Once you're afraid, that's a very important part of your conscious experience that you then use to further adapt to the situation uh, that you're in. So, you know, the, the, it's often said that there's an inverted U shape to the role of fear or anxiety in uh, performance, so that a little bit of fear or anxiety is needed to get you to work on the test, uh, but too much takes you to the other side where the, the stress hormones that are being released in that stressful situation are impairing your cognitive uh, capacity. Okay, over here, please, sir. Thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. I'm retired. And I was, I, I've read recently some articles that indicate that they found a positive correlation between, beside, uh, between the size of the amygdala and a person's social and political conservatism. Uh, well, I'm wondering if there's any explanation or mechanism or some, some theory that might explain the correlation. Well, lot, you can get lots of correlations with lots of things. And you know, <laughs> there's, um, there are all kinds of studies showing you know, the Republicans have this activation and Democrats have that activation, or religious people have this. I think it's mostly noise. You know, it's, it, I wouldn't make too much of it. Yeah, I think the thing to, to remember is that we're incredibly early in the stage of trying to use neuroscience to tell us anything uh, meaningful about individual differences. So I completely agree with Joe that, that any of those kinds of associations uh, I would not put much stock in. You know, it's, it's really hard to figure out how the brain works when you have a very simple stimulus and a very specific response. <laughs> Um, so once you get into something so complicated as you know, politics or religion, it becomes almost impossible Wait, you, at this stage of things. And one of the other really frustrating things I gotta say is that um, particularly when you, when you work with people, um, and it relates to some of the questions about the media age, there, there is this pressure to make bigger stories out of things. And you, you were talking a little bit about that with some of the amygdala lesion um, highlights. Um, things are really complicated and the stories aren't simple. And whenever you start hearing a simple story, it's usually wrong when it involves complicated things. Okay, well, uh, I want to continue, but I don't think we can entertain any more people to ask questions that are already up there given our time constraints. As you stay up there, stay there, we'll get to you. Please, again, make your question as succinct as possible. Um, my name is Jeff Daly, I'm at USIS. And um, Dr. Ledoux, you briefly mentioned that um, we may have inadvertently developed drugs to treat behavioral responses instead of the actual feelings of fear by using these uh, so-called fear conditioning experiments. Uh, has that been demonstrated in humans? And do you think there might actually be any uh, maybe hidden therapeutic benefit to that effect? Well, I think there's tremendous benefit um, <clears throat> simply because you know if it, it, you do have to treat those symptoms, and if in fact these drugs like SSRIs or having a greater effect on that than the conscious experience, and it, it could be very useful. Uh, is there evidence? Danny, what would you say? Uh, we're just kind of starting with these kinds of things, so not, not really. Pro probably the biggest evidence we have that something's wrong is that there have been a lot of uh, attempts to develop better medicines by kind of following the model that, that Joe outlined, and they've failed. So there have been many, many instances where drugs have, a, or medicines have, incredibly powerful effects on rodents, and we think they should have powerful effects on feeling states in people, and, and they don't. And probably the best example are the so-called CRF antagonists. This is a whole group of medications that were developed out of work with rodents, and they really turned out not to work. We think because they were targeting one system when we really need them to target the other. I mean, the other thing is that if you correlate behavior, physiology, subjective experiences in people, they aren't well correlated. So, you know, there's, there's a disconnect there that needs to be addressed. Yes, ma'am. Please. 
Hello, I'm Caroline. I'm a graduate student at it, George Mason. I'm a little bit too tall for this microphone. Um, Dr. Pine, this is kind of a question for you. So you had mentioned that the there's some sort of erasing going on with fear extinction learning. However, one of the main camps right now is that fear extinction learning is not the same thing as yeah. getting or erasing. Yeah, right. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, sure. Well, this is actually work Joe did. Uh, the, do you want to talk about the fear? I didn't hear the question. But she was, I, that I made that like throwaway comment about extinction is not erasure. Right. But there is this other form of erasure, and she was, I would call it dampening rather than erasure. Okay. Uh, okay. Erasure is a little too strong, but okay. um, it's a comp long, complicated story. Basically, if you prevent the restorage of memory after the retrieval of the memory, uh, the memory is no longer as effective. So, and these are mainly kind of amygdala-based memories, not quote conscious memories. So, a rat that has uh, been given, say, a protein synthesis inhibitor after the retrieval of a tone shock association uh, is unable to restore the memory and because of the blockade of protein synthesis. And as a result of that, the animal no longer responds to the threat. So this, this study was published in 2000 by Kareem Nader and myself. Um, and uh, four years later, the movie The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind came out. So it's a similar kind of right. idea. Right. OK, two more, please. Uh, this question is for Professor Ledoux. I'm Richard Shaw from the American University. And you spoke a moment ago about how the emotions are contagious. If I understand you, you're claiming that the emotions are conscious entities. And so what I'm interested in is what is the mechanism of contagion? How does the contagion take place? Well, you see, I mean, the, you know, the, when I, as I was saying that, I felt a little uncomfortable, but I let it slide. But yes, yeah, so. There are going to be as several aspects of that. So you observe someone else acting, quote, afraid. And so that allows your conscious mind to then activate that fear schema in your mind. And therefore, you sort of pattern complete to fear. But at the same time, your unconscious brain is also observing all of this. And the amygdala, for example, will be activated when you see someone else in a state of danger, because that's a threat to you. And so all of these things are going to be happening simultaneously and will come together so that once the amygdala is activated, that's going to provide feed forward signals that make the conscious pattern completion of fear more effective and rolling forward. So that's what I would say about that. Thank you. OK, final question. Kat Wickman with uh, NAMI Nova. I have a question about um, the research where exposure to, to, to trauma as a predictor for mental illness and maybe even more so than genetics? Yeah, well, so, there, so as, as many people might know, that there are very, very strong ex, uh, associations between being uh, exposed to a trauma and developing a whole range of uh, mental health problems. And it's a little bit like Joe was just talking about, about other complex phenomena. Understanding why and how that happens is in incredibly complicated. We do think, and, there, and there's um, a fair amount of evidence to support this, that there's some direct effect, that, th that there's some direct effect of being exposed to trauma, that it is really bad for you, and that it in some ways harmful to the brain, and that leads to problems on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also true that people who are exposed to trauma are not a random sample. Um, they tend to be uh, in circumstances where there are a whole bunch of other bad things going on. So it's very hard to say, is it this one trauma that is really the, the bad thing, or is it all the other things that go with the trauma that, that's really bad? And then the third thing to say is that, you know, one of the trickiest things about studying people is that um, it's almost impossible to uh, remove um, uh, one cause from one effect. So um, p usually problems develop in people who have trauma after they have multiple repeated traumas. And figuring out what exactly is the cause and what's the effect in those cascades is, is almost impossible. And that's where studies in you know, rodents or non-human primates where you can directly manipulate have a much greater capacity to tell us what's really causing what in, the, in those situations. Okay, on that note, please join me in thanking our panelists.